What is also interesting is that during pre-colonization indigenous societies, so this is pre-colonization. So when we talk about colonization, this is basically white men, okay? Uh, white men or Caucasian men exploring the world and uh, calling the place that they visited as, uh, as their discoveries, okay? As you can see, for example, in pre-colonization Thailand, so before they were exposed to Western culture, there was actually no... Uh, specific word for homosexuality. Actually, the the nearest word that they used was as was uh, is pronounced as katoy. Katoy actually reflects more in terms of androgyny. So that means the individual has, uh, let's say, uh, the man has female characteristics or the woman has male characteristics, but they considered that as normal. So they did not consider that as pathological. Unfortunately, over the years, the, the word katoy now specifically refers to lady boys or the transsexual males, the male to female transsexuals. But before, it just reflected on um, how, how uh, the Thai would consider uh, an individual as having both a male and female characteristics. In fact, before um, colonization or before the white men came, Thai people would dress up androgynously. It was when the Western influence came that men had to wear uh, clothes that, that would look like pants and women had to wear clothes that would look like dresses or skirts. But before that, they had very similar uh, ways of dressing. In the Native American civilization, in pre-colonization times, so that means before Columbus came over there, they would refer to the individual uh, as having both a male, a masculine uh, or a feminine spirit. Okay, so, so essentially you would have a masculine, a pure masculine spirit, a feminine spirit, and then one that had mixed. Okay, so again, to them, this was nothing unusual and something that was acceptable and primarily changed over time as uh, Western civilization started to manifest its uh, influence over uh, pre-colonial uh, civilizations or cultures. Okay, In the South Pacific uh, regions, we also find this in the South Pacific Islanders. Uh, so this was, so th th that means this was not something that you, we, we would have just seen in one specific culture. Okay. So that this, so that, for example, so the Spanish conquerors, particularly in South America, were therefore very horrified to discover sodomy or anal sex openly being practiced among native peoples, and they attempted to crush it out. They called this process verdache, okay? And so under their rule, they, they did severe penalties, including public executions, burning, and being torn to pieces by rabid dogs, as seen in this... Uh, I would say photograph drawing um, that reflected uh, the and this was reflect Balboa, Portuguese uh, colonizer that that can be seen in uh, the New York Public Library. Okay, so but for the locals, for the natives, it was fine. But for the but for the Western colonizers, this was something that was unacceptable. Okay. So you could see you could see that influence coming also from the British, from the Spanish, the Portuguese. Okay. The French were not too bad actually. Thus, over the years, homosexuality was considered a perversion or a disorder as a result of these influences. In the 1940s, psychoanalysts such as Sandor Rado argued that homosexuality was a phobic condition. So again, the emphasis on homosexuality as a as a medical disorder or some mental health condition. As you can see in this picture from Nazi Germany, homosexuals were segregated and also sent to concentration camps like the Jews, okay? And they were actually identified and by, by and they were labeled with a pink star on, on their on their chest. Okay. This was truly unfortunate because before Hitler came to power, Germany actually exercised an open and accepting attitudes towards homosexuals with plenty of bars uh, catering to men in Berlin. If you, if uh, for, for some of you who are old enough, if you can recall the movie and the musical stage musical Cabaret, okay, the Kit Kat Club, okay, that was an example of that. So 
homosexuality was widely accepted or openly accepted uh, at the time in in Berlin okay by the by by the time that DSM1 was published homosexuality uh was sufficiently uh pathologized to be included as a sociopathic personality disorder so this is where the problem also came in because in DSM1 in the very first issue of DSM1 uh, homosexuality was considered as a mental health condition and specifically uh, labeled as a sociopathic personality disorder. Imagine being gay and being labeled as a sociopath, okay? Um, which is practically equivalent to being a criminal, okay? Uh, because that's how we basically would label criminals now. They are would refer to as sociopaths or psychopaths. So imagine... How, how much negative impact that, that placed on the gay individual. Okay. So as a result, this gave rise to militant action from gay individuals, leading to a lot of protests and petitions to stop the persecution of homosexuals. Unfortunately, psychological theories continue to denigrate homosexuality and to label it as a disorder. For example, Havelock Ellis labeled it as a phobic condition similar to Sandor Rado, and Richard von Kraft Ebbing, a, a German, called it psychopathia sexualis. So again, bordering on something that was psychopathic or abnormal. Okay. Um, fortunately, unfortunately, well, on one hand, fortunately, Sigmund Freud, the father of psychoanalysis, had this to say. I mean, just look at the second uh, statement. Homosexuality is assuredly nothing to be ashamed of. So for Sigmund Freud, homosexuality was not a disorder. Okay, um, And he, he, that's why he said because he could see it in other respectable individuals. And in fact, the problem is if the individual has issues about homosexuality, but homosexuality per se was not considered, he did not consider homosexuality per se as a mental health condition. Unfortunately, this was considered an unpopular opinion at the time. So there were more individuals who considered uh, uh, homosexuality as a disorder rather than uh, as a normal phenomenon in everyday human life. Okay. So again, uh, you know, the protests continued okay um, and at the time well at, at the time in the 1950s and this was of course specifically in the in North America in the United States okay there were two there were a lot of groups who were protesting that the, the two biggest groups were the following the first one was the Matachin society and this was a male centric organization male centric means because they were they still had uh, female members okay uh, but it was more male centric, so that eventually the female members decided to split off. So about ten years later, they formed a group called the Daughters of Bilitis. Okay, so so eventually the Matachi Society became more known as the group for homosexual males, and the uh, Daughters of Bilitis was more known as the group for homosexual females. So both groups continued to. Uh, to do petitions, do protests, uh, and uh, you know, try that. What they did was they tried to engage, uh, you know, the government and uh, anyone else as far as uh, the the consideration of homosexuality as not a mental disorder. Okay, um, in the lower photo on the right, that this is an example of some of the protests that they did. What they sometimes would do. And they targeted primarily the American Psychiatric Association. I mean, why not? The, the APA considered homosexuality as a disorder. So why not target the APA? So what would, they would sometimes do is that they would go to where the APA would have their annual meetings. And then they would, like in this case, they would either protest outside, in the, outside the convention centers, or they would even infiltrate the sessions and cause disruption, particularly sessions that were discussing gender identity or homosexuality is okay so so be, because you know they wanted to be heard and they wanted their, uh, their their position to be you know to be accepted and uh presented to these individuals okay however by the time the dsm2 was published in 1968 the dsm still considered homosexuality as a disorder but this time they recategorized homosexuality as a paraphilia or a sexual disorder so at least so at least in the sociopathic 
personality disturbance. So to, to a certain, in fact, some of the homosexuals at the time accepted this. They actually preferred this diagnosis rather than being considered a criminal. Because remember, if you were gay and at the time if you were considered a sociopath, then you would not be able to gain employment. Okay. Uh, so and that's the reason why a lot of gay individuals at the time would really hide in the closet because you know you're a highly functional individual and yet you cannot you will not be able to find work if they find out that 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 you're, you're that you're gay. So again, bowing into the pressure that was being presented by a lot of the protesters, the DSM reclassified it as a paraphilia or as a sexual uh, disorder. Okay, but. Uh, there were leading theorists at the time, for example, the woman here by the name of Evelyn Hooker. And of course, we, we were more familiar with Alfred Kinsey. Uh, they supported the opposite conclusion. For example, Evelyn Hooker's work suggested homosexual men were clinically indistinguishable from heterosexual men. Because what, what, she, what she did was she studied the group of heterosexual men and homosexual men and compared them in terms of various characteristics. And she found that she could, you could not really tell one from the other as far as those characteristics were concerned. And of course, we're familiar with Kinsey's studies, particularly the spectrum of heterosexuality and homosexuality, the seven-point spectrum. At one end, you're purely homosexual. At the other end, you're purely homo heterosexual. And then different gradations along the line. This was as a result of Kinsey's extensive interviews with American men and women. And this suggested that homosexual acts were far more common than once believed. Okay, So it tended to be more a uh, normal event rather than something that was purely abnormal. Then these two individuals. Remember, I mentioned to you about the Matachin Society and the Daughters of Bilities. So uh, the man on the right, that's Frank Kameni. He's uh, a member of the Matachin Society. Frank used to work for the U.S. Army. He was in the MAP service. So he was an illustrator. Um, and he was fired from his job because, because of his homosexuality, because he was open about it. Okay. On the other hand, the woman on the left is uh, Barbara Gittings. Barbara Gittings was a member of the Daughters of Belize, and she was actually the lead editor of their publication called The Ladder. Uh, because of the, you know, those protest, protest actions, these two came to meet eventually, and they started talking, and then they started working together. And uh, what they both agreed on was that they needed to... Uh, like that their organizations needed to work together, but they had to narrow down their focus. So Kameni and Gittings held a psychiatry clearly with the crosshairs of the new, more active gay rights organization. Okay? Because at the time, there were more and more gay rights organizations starting up, and these two individuals were instrumental in helping them you know, try to be more collaborative with each other. With each other. As the 1960s progressed, psychiatrists found themselves facing more and more hostile environment from these protesters. Okay, Psychiatrists not, now found the people who only years before were happy to listen to them, discuss the pathology of sex, se same-sex attraction, picketing outside their fences, disrupting their conferences, and leafletting their lectures. So before, this, this individual was very supportive. Now they're the ones who were very disruptive. A significant event in the late 1960s was in 1969. So for those of you who are familiar uh, with New York and the Stonewall uh, Inn, okay, uh, it, the Stonewall is a gay club. And um, it, as a gay club, of course, therefore it would be frequented by a lot of gay men. But the police kept uh, raiding it, okay, although they had legal permits. The police would continue to like until one night when the patrons of the bar got fed up and they, they, they decided to make a stand. And so that's what we call the, the Stonewall riots, okay? So they didn't give up their, they, they refused to, to be cowed by the, the police, you know, and this gave rise to, uh, uh, you know, a better discussion and understanding about gay rights. And so this type of activism enervated. Uh, or, 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 or further stimulated the the individuals like uh, uh, Gittings and, and Kameni okay, to try to pursue further what they wanted to achieve as far as recognition of uh, homosexuality as not a mental disorder. Okay? So that was in 69. The following year, the APA had their annual meeting in San Francisco in 1970 in San Francisco. Okay, so this was a 
terrible thing because as we know, San Francisco is the hub of gay rights activism in, in, in the U.S. So naturally for gay activists, the opportunity could not be passed up and the decision was made to protest the convention as they have been doing in the previous years. So activists picketed outside while others disrupted expert panels. So they continued to do what they were doing before. So they would even disrupt uh, ongoing sessions. Okay, And they would also confront psychiatrists, particularly those who propagated the notion of homosexuality as an illness, okay? Um, so the following year, what the APA did was they spoke with Kameni and Gittings. They said, oh, uh, so, that they, they would, so that they would minimize or lessen the disruption. They said, why don't we give you uh, no, um, like a panel, okay? So tell your, tell, tell your uh, co-activists that we'll give you a panel, so just stop, stop all these protests, okay? So so they they so Kameni and Gittings hosted a limited panel at the 1971 APA convention. But despite that, protests still occurred. This time with activists even even uh, storming the podium during the opening ceremony of the APA convention. Just imagine if something disrupted like this happened at the PPA convention. How how much fun would that be? The however, by the time the 1972 convention APA convention in Dallas, Texas. The APA realized that the only way to avoid more disruptions would be to allow gay activists some more prominent voice within the proceedings. Okay, so the activists were given a booth in the scientific hall so that they could give out live, uh, leaflets, you no, know, and answer questions and things like that. And they also organized another panel, and this one, and this time the panel was designed to include both activists and psychiatrists. So the two activists would still be Kameni and Gittings, and there were two psychiatrists who would be part of the panel. One of the uh, psychiatrists at the uh, one of the psychiatrists was at the time the vice president of the APA. His name was J Jude Marmor. Okay, so um, as, as you can see in in this picture, okay. So if you look at the bigger picture on the left, that's that's Gittings on the far left. And then uh, Kameni uh, in the middle, and then of course there's Dr. Henry Armstrong. Okay, at the smaller picture you can see the, uh, Dr. Jude Marmor speaking at the podium. So the task of organizing the panel, the panel was entitled "Psychiatry: Friend or Foe to the Homosexual?" Question mark A dialogue. This was left to Gittings, okay, who had no hesitation in vetting Kameni back once again. And Gittings also asked several psychiatrists who supported the removal of homosexuality from the SM to speak. So that included uh, the two psychiatrists plus uh, Vice President Jude Marmor at the time. Now, once the panel was arranged and its members secured, uh, Gittings had a girlfriend at the time, uh, also a very staunch uh, activist. You know, and she was talking to Gittings and said, uh, you know what, what, what's, what's lacking, okay, because you have two activists and then you have two, uh, two, you have two gay activists and you have two psychiatrists. You know what would be great if you have a gay psychiatrist in your panel, okay? Okay, so what happened was Gittings, Barbara Gittings being the one who was organizing the panel, it fell up to her to be able to find uh, a gay psychiatrist. And this gay psychiatrist was Dr. Henry Armstrong. Okay. Uh, sorry, Dr. Henry Anonymous. So who is Dr. Henry Anonymous? Well, before he became Dr. Henry Anonymous, he was first Dr. John Fryer. Dr. Fryer was a gifted psychiatrist with a keen interest in end-of-life care. In, in fact, over the years later on, he, he became such, such one of the leading experts in, hospice, in the hospice concept in end of life care because that was the focus of his uh, training and interest. Uh, but but before Gittings came to meet him, he or he as a, an openly because he was openly gay. Okay, uh, even during his his residency, he was openly gay. And in fact, as a result, he was fired from his residency training program at the University of Pennsylvania uh, because because he was gay. Okay, he was open, openly gay, um, and he had to go to public hospitals to be able to finish his residency. And of course, uh, it, because as you know, even, even in the Philippines, it's much better to, to take up your training in uh, training hospitals or university-based hospitals, okay? Um, 
And but because to go to a public hospital in the U.S. at the time to do your training meant you know um, lower resources and and better less lesser quality of training. But he had to endure that because he didn't want to because because he was uh, fired from uh, his position as a resident at the University of Pennsylvania. In, 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 he was fired from another institution actually later on, but that, that, that was the time he was already working. Okay? He was sort of like a staff member already. Because one boss who had discovered his sexuality reasoned out that it might, it might have been more acceptable if it was just scamp but straight. Okay? Or he, it would also be, have been acceptable if he was uh, homosexual but but non-effeminate. But the fact that he was gay and effeminate or camp at the same time was not acceptable to his boss. So he was, he was fired from, from his role. And that's why when Barbara Geetings approached him to, to be a speaker in, in that panel, he refused because at the time he had a non-tenured, okay, he was a non-tenured clinical faculty member at, uh, at the Temple, at Temple University in Philadelphia. So non-tenured means his position was not yet permanent. Okay, so that means he could be taken out at any time for even the flimsiest of, of reasons. So he wanted to protect that because that you know, uh, because you know he he wanted to work as a psychiatrist. He wanted to um, to, to to do what he loved to do. In fact. His colleagues over the years, when, um, when individuals, when his colleagues were uh, talking about the quality, his, his work ethic, they sometimes said that they, they said that he oftentimes would stay as late as eleven o'clock in the evening or at midnight just to talk with the dying patients that were under his care. Okay, because he would stay in the more early in the morning, but still leave late at night because you know. He wanted to really take good care of the dying patients that were under his uh, under his service. That's why he, he was so afraid when Barbara Gittings approached him. He was so afraid that if, if he came out into the open and, and spoke at the APA convention that he would lose all this. Okay. Um, now, how did Barbara Gittings get to talk to uh, uh, John Fryer? Okay, this is a bit funny. In... In the APA, there's an underground, underground group of gay and lesbian psychiatrists, mostly gay psychiatrists, and they call themselves the gay PA. Okay, so instead of APA, they call they call themselves the gay PA, and they would usually meet uh, at a, at a different venue at the same time as the APA uh, annual meeting. Okay, so if there if it was a break, then they would meet at a different hotel. Okay, so. Uh, because of Barbara Gittings' connections, he was able to get some names uh, of the members of the gay PA, and one of the names that she came across with was uh, John Fryer. Um, but by the time he got to John Fryer, all the members of the gay PA that she approached flat out rejected or refused the invitation. However, so then she kept coming back to everyone, including John Fryer. Then eventually, after about 10 months or more, and this was practically almost uh, near the APA annual meeting already, um, John Fryer had a change of mind, a change of heart, I'm sorry, and a change of mind, okay? And then because he, he felt that it was something that he wanted to do, okay? But he didn't want to put in jeopardy what he was already doing as a psychiatrist. So when Gittings came back to contact him again, he said, okay, yes, I'll do this, but on the condition that I will wear a disguise, okay? And of course, Barbara Gittings agreed. She said, you can wear anything you want. Fortunately, at that time, uh, John Fry, one of his friends, was a uh, uh, drama major at uh, Temple University. So this, this, this friend helped him with the makeup and the mask and the wig and the, and the oversized tuxedo. And he also used a microphone with a voice uh, changer so that his natural voice would, would, be, would be changed. And this is what, what Fryer said at the time. I thought about it and realized it was something that had to be done. I had been thrown out of a residency because I was gay. I had lost a job because I was gay. That perspective needed to be heard from a gay psychiatrist by an audience that perhaps might be more inclined to listen to a psychiatrist. But he couldn't do it himself. He, had, he added, well, if I think about it, I could do it if I could wear a mask and have a distorted microphone and wear a costume. Um, 
the mask actually was a Richard Nixon mask. Remember, this was in the 70s, okay? Um, and that's and of course he didn't want to use his name, so that's why they came up with the name Henry Anonymous. Now, why did he want to use a different name, and why did he want to uh, put on this this guys? There one reason, because also he mentioned this because he didn't want people to focus on him as John Fryer. He wanted them to focus on him as being a gay psychiatrist, not necessarily because he was John Fryer, but because he was a gay psychiatrist. And so May 2, 1972 came, and uh, at the panel, each member uh, spoke so that, uh, so Kameni and Gittings and the two psychiatrists spoke. And at the very last second, uh, as you can see, there's a curtain. At the, so people thought there were just four people who were speaking. And then uh, Gittings was the fourth one to speak. And then she segued into Henry, uh, Dr. Henry Anonymous, who then stepped out from behind the curtain. So he had to be brought in. Uh, as you know, in hotels, there are, there are back doors and things like that. So that, that so he was that, that's where he passed. So that's why no one saw him come into the ballroom because he went through the back, okay? Um, so the psychiatrists on the panel argued that the evidence for homosexuality as a pathology was limited and biased. Kameni asked the psychiatrists to ally themselves with uh, gay activists. Gittings, foreshadowing Dr. Anonymous, spoke of the gay psychiatrists operating within the profession. And then Dr. Anonymous stepped out and spoke. His very first line, I am a homosexual, I am a psychiatrist, was how he began. He added, I, I like most of you in this room, I'm a member of the APA and proud of that membership. He explained how for hundreds of gay psychiatrists present at the convention, the ones that were called the gay PA, only by ensuring that no one in a position of power is aware of our sexual preference or gender identity could they hope to thrive in their profession. So what he was emphasizing was that they, that's the reason why they needed to hide their sexuality because they didn't want anyone who was in a position of power over them to be able to manipulate them in any way. He continued by highlighting the difficulties involved in trying to keep a coherent sense of health when by being gay, you were technically ill, okay? So imagine being gay and being considered technically uh, suffering from a mental health disorder at the same time. He pointed to the irony that many gay psychiatrists would work up to 20 hours daily to protect the institutions who actually would literally chew them up and spit them out without batting an eyelash. He would throw them under the bus just because they were gay. So that's why he directed his comments to the members of the gay PA. He tasked them with showing creative ingenuity in challenging the status quo and implored to pull your courage up by your bootstraps for we all have something to lose, okay? So he wanted them all to work together. Finally, he said, uh, he noted that there was a loss to humanity that was being inflicted on the gay psychiatrists by forcing them to hide their identity. He said, we are taking a risk, however, in not living full our humanity with all of the lessons it has to teach all other humans around us. He finished his speech by declaring that gay psychiatrists must use our skills and wisdom to help them, the heterosexuals, and us grow to be more comfortable with that little piece of humanity called homosexuality. Dr. Arm, Dr. Uh, Anonymous' speech ran a little over 10 minutes and it ended with a standing ovation from the audience. So this was May 2, 1972. And of course, this put into motion several other events, okay? Uh, so Because I just wanted to emphasize that this was not just the incident that, that caused that change in the DSM. This was uh, uh, arguably or even considered by many as that instigating event, because about a year later, the, the APA then removed homosexuality uh, as a, a mental disorder in the DSM. Unfortunately, the, the, it still evolved over time because although homosexuality per se was not considered a mental disorder anymore, but they, they still did have that category of ego dystonic homosexuality or sexual orientation disorder. So eventually, you know, those things were eventually delisted as well. Um, since his testimony at the APA, 
uh, John, Dr. John Fryer kept to himself, actually. He didn't tell anyone else, even his family, even his sister, his mother. They didn't tell, he didn't tell them about what they did, but he felt a, some degree of, of satisfaction. Okay, over the years, he would mention it to some friends who were actually would be surprised that uh, he, 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 was, he was that man. Okay. He died in 2003, and uh, Philadelphia, where he lived, erected this uh, marker uh, in the middle of a town square that was considered the gay neighborhood. And I'd like to read this to you. So John E. Fryer, MD, 1937 to 2003. Temple professor and psychiatrist Fryer, disguised as Dr. Anonymous, spoke against the American Psychiatric Association's classification of homosexuality as a mental illness at the APA's 1972 annual meeting. Fryer's testimony persuaded the APA to declassify homosexuality as a mental disorder in 1973, ending treatments such as chemical castration, electric shock therapy, and lobotomy, and paving the way for advances in LGBT civil rights. Okay. At this time, I'd like to share something uh, this is a short uh, video of the last minute of the testimony by Dr. Fryer. It's just audio recording, so I hope it's clear enough for you to be able to listen to. This is the greatest loss. Our honest humanity. And that loss leads all those others around us to lose that little bit of their humanity as well. For if they were truly comfortable with their own homosexuality, then they could be comfortable with ours. As homosexual psychiatrists, therefore, we must use our skills and wisdom to help all of them and ourselves grow to be comfortable with that little piece of humanity called homosexuality. I would just like to end with a um, quote from Dr. Fryer. So this was the first things that he said when he testified and I'd like to end with this statement. I am a homosexual, I am a psychiatrist. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your kind attention. And at this point, I'd like to open the floor for any additional insights or comments or questions from everyone's attending here tonight. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, th uh, th thank you for the emojis. Okay. Thank you very much, Bong, for a wonderful and very inspiring uh, uh, and very eye-opening uh, talk on Dr. Fryer. I've often wondered how that happened. And now you, you told us about how it happened pala. Yes. Uh, and it's all due to that one man who was very brave to do it. Yes, thank you, Bong. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Much Mary. appreciated. Yeah, my pl my pleasure. Okay, because I I I I don't know if we could imagine ourselves in a similar situation that we would put ourselves, uh, you know, front in and under the scrutiny of of everyone. Um, of course, that the, the disguise helped. Okay, but but still, it. I would assume that it took a lot of uh, courage for Dr. Fryer to be able to stand up and 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 do what he did. Okay. So, yung bang the, the question of each one of us would would be able to dig deep inside of us and be able to do that. Okay. So thanks, Annie, for for the kind words. Okay. Anyone else? Anyone would like to share their own personal insights about 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 this issue? Or if you have you come across also the story of uh, Dr. Anonymous.
Yes, Berna. Hi, sir. Congratulations. Hi, Berna. Thank you. My question is more, my comment actually is more of a question. Mm-hmm. So I realize that in other countries in Southeast Asia, the mentioned um, interventions are still being done, like yung conversion therapy, yes. mm-hmm. um, castration. You're right. I was wondering, when did it get better here in the Philippines? And how, how did that happen? Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that, that's true though but even in North America uh, conversion therapies are still ongoing although their conversion therapies now in America are more in terms of camps no? so they send the, the young individual to attend camps and then it, it is more in terms of religious conversions um, the, the Philippines like the experience in Thailand you know, we generally have a much more accepting attitude kasi, towards gay people. Although we have, uh, it, it, it's not a full sense of acceptance, but um, we, we don't usually seek change as far as the individuals are concerned. Okay? I think in the Philippines, they would prefer to um, tell them to go packing <laughs> rather than uh, seek change. Okay? Uh, but the society has changed, particularly because um, because in the Philippines, particularly, we have a good sense of acceptance about gay celebrities, diba? yeah, actors, comedians in particular, okay? and among families. In in fact, uh, there are there is a tendency for some families now to think uh, having a gay son or a gay daughter to be a lot, sort of luck, lucky charm, okay, because. Uh, this, these are the individuals who are basically hardworking and would really find ways. Okay. Um, so that overall in Southeast Asia, I'm not sure if there is a very rampant uh, approach, uh, you know, processes such as conversion therapies. Okay. I, I would I still I would still assume that there are, but not probably as uh, widespread as what we, we still see now in, in the United States. I was. I just like to mention, you know, So, so the testimony of Dr. John Fryer was 1972. So that means last year, 2022, it celebrated its 50th year. Imagine, you know, 50 years since his, his testimony. Okay. So, like, so it, imagine it's been, it's been such a long time. So, it, parang, parang it, it puts. Uh, it, it's good to put it in in that context, and yet. Almost fifty years, but but still there is some struggles that are that are still ongoing. Yeah, um, when when I when I used to attend the APA a lot, so this was in the two thousands, in the ni- late nineteen nineties, early two thousands. Of of course, there were no ano, uh, uh, mga gay protesters. Actually, the protesters were mostly from Scientology. Those who would wear would be in black, but they. But uh, I guess the APA learned their lesson from the gay protests because now, if if you don't have a badge, you won't be able to go inside the convention hall, right? Not you won't you won't even be able to not just the convention hall, but the convention building. You won't be able to get in. That that's why when I used to attend, um, it, and it can be pretty scary, you know, because the. The Scientologists, they will be wearing black and they would be kids as well, elderly people, uh, middle-aged individuals and kids. And they and when, when you when you when you step inside the the revolving doors of the convention center, they would shout at you, you know, they would call you names, okay, uh, murderers, you know, things, stuff like that. Uh, so it can be pretty scary if you're not used to that. But at least there were no gay protesters already. So who knows? Okay. Any other comments or any any uh, sharing from the individuals in the group? You're welcome, Berna. See here. So again, if so again, thank if if there are no. Uh, other questions or comments again I'd like to thank everyone for being with us tonight and then we are planning already the second uh, session of the rainbow connection and we, we we are grateful that dr rj valdez 
will be our next speaker. So uh, topic to be determined. But um, again, please uh, uh, just just wait for the announcements in the PPA Viber community. Okay. Good night, everyone. Thank you for being with us tonight. I hope you learned some some good things about the presentation this week. Good night. Thanks a lot. Thank you. God bye. Bless. bye. God bless. Good night, Paul. Thanks, Bong. Hi, Good thank night. you, Dong Jaffet. Good night. Thank you, Dr. Chingai.